Welcome to the Choosing Happiness Podcast with me, your host, Rudrani Davy, the Happiness Lady. In these conversations, we will be discussing an uncommon way to find joy in your life with weekly special guests. Did you know you could choose your happy? Won't you come and play and discover how these magical tools could work for you? Let's do this. Well, howdy, y'all, and welcome to the Choosing Happiness podcast with the happiness lady, Rudrani Davy. wrote a book about it. I am so happy today to have the fabulous Mr. Kent Blazy on our podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kent. Well, and, uh, you know, you're the happiness uh, lady and guru and whatever, and I'm the happiest man in the universe. So there you I, go. I love it. I'm going to just say a little bit about Kent Blaze. I'm going to read it out here off my computer before I get started. Um, he's an American country music singer and songwriter who has written songs for Garth Brooks, Reba McIntyre, Kenny Chesney, John Party, Patty Loveless. That's just a name of very, very, very few. Um, he's an inductee of the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame has a total of seven number one hits. It could be more now. I don't know. This might be old information. And he just released his 11th album, which I'd like to talk about as well. So how's that for an intro? That's a great intro. You're hired. Giddy up. I am now Kent Blazy's publicist. I like it. Okay. All right then. So how did you know? I mean, what got you to Nashville? Tell me a little bit about the backstory of how you became this fabulous singer songwriter and blessed us in Nashville with your talents and abilities. Well, after I learned how to play guitar, the first thing I wanted to do is start writing songs. And I've been writing poetry that had gotten published like in high school newspapers and stuff like that. And so um, I immediately put lyrics to my stuff with the guitar because I didn't know anybody else's songs. And so I just kept working on that. I got in some bands and they would play some of my songs. Other people where I was from in Lexington, Kentucky heard them and they would start playing some of my songs. And uh, so I just kept uh, going further and further into songwriting and uh, playing in bands and coming to Nashville and taking songs around and getting shot down or whatever. But um, I played with uh, this guy, Ian Tyson, that was like the Bob Dylan of Canada, kind of like Gordon Lightfoot or whatever. And oh, wow. uh, I was in his band and he let me play before he came on stage with his band and play all my original material. And he was very encouraging about moving to Nashville. And I had been on the road for about eight or nine years and was tired of the road. So I thought, well, I'll just go to Nashville and see if I can hunker down, be a songwriter. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. I didn't know you actually wrote poetry beforehand. This is the first time I've actually heard about that yet. I'd love to yeah. see. Have you ever published any of your poetry? No, I never have. It's once I started writing songs, I don't think I ever wrote very many poems after that. Well, I guess, you know, a poem, a song is a, is a poem set to music. So that's what they say. I, I reckon you're still doing it. Well, that's fabulous. So I understand. I remember you telling me that when you first got here, to, you know, to make ends meet, you know, you're writing for yourself or, or whatever, but you also had a studio in your home, your first right. home, I guess. And you started co-writing or meeting other up and coming artists because you were helping them with demos. And tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, when you're a songwriter in Nashville, probably anywhere, you have to have as many irons in the fire as you can. So I was writing songs during the day, I was playing in a band at night um, and I had a little studio, it was just a little four track and I would do demos of my own things and people heard them and they wanted me to start doing demos for them. So it progressed from a four track to an eight track to a 12 track to 16 track to 22 track and a 32 track. And then uh, in Nashville, if you sing like me, you need people called demo singers. And my demo singers at the time were Faith Hill and Martina McBride, Joe Diffie, uh, Billy Dean, Randy Travis, Trisha Yearwood. And uh, they all, that's how you got a record deal back then. Now it's how many social numbers do you have? But right. it used to be when they sang one of your songs, they would get played for producers and artists and record labels. And people would want to know who was singing that. And um so all of them went on to be big stars, but they all sang demos for me while they were waiting for the star to rise. 
Wow. That's amazing. And were they singing um, your songs or were they coming to you with some of their own songs as well? No, what a demo singer does. Now you would bring your own songs, but uh, the uh, demo singers were there to sing demos for other people. And if they weren't just my songs, I was doing demos for people in town, but also around the country that had heard some of my demos. And, uh, you know, it was lucky that I could get people like Joe Diffie or Trisha Yearwood to be singing oh demos for other people. But uh, yeah, that was their role, not to pitch songs, not to sing their songs. It was to be a demo singer on the songs that you were asking them to sing. Right. I remember Trisha telling me, um, I was a film producer at one point and uh, we did, I think, I don't know, half a dozen videos for off and on from different companies that I was with. And I remember her telling me, you know, she goes, I didn't ever plan on being an artist. I was, you know, hired just to sing demos for them to pitch to other artists. And I thought, well, what would it take for me to be a demo singer? Of course, that ship had already sailed by the time she Pretty much, died. Yeah, that, there's no such thing as demo singers much anymore. Because mm -hmm. I, sang, I sang jingles. I don't know if you were aware of that, but I got hired to sing jingles because back in the day before it was all electronic, it was all on um, film that had to be spliced. Right. And it was so much work. And what they loved is I could double my vocals and I could find harmonies for them that they didn't even know were there. And I had to start getting hired in a different way because they were paying me by the hour and I would get it all done in an hour. And I'm like, wait a minute now, <laughs> you right. got all this material because I can do it fast. You're, you know, you're going to have to pay me more money to, to right. do it. So yeah, the industry has changed a whole lot. So versus back then, Skipping forward to today, what is the difference? What, what are you well, noticing? The big difference is songwriters aren't getting paid. And, uh, you know, what happened was in 2016, they stopped making CDs. Hmm. And so songwriters basically get paid when somebody buys a CD. If you and I wrote a song that George Strait cut uh, and it was on a record every time a George Strait record with that song on it sold, we would get a little money. Right. So uh, in 2016, when they stopped making CDs, the next year, 2017, they took them out of any cars. So you couldn't buy a CD player in your car. So basically, it seems like it was a conspiracy to me to get everybody to get onto streaming. And even if you had, you know, a thousand CDs, you had nothing to play it on anymore because it wasn't in your car. And so that's when the mechanical money dried up for songwriters and um, it all went to uh, digital streaming and people don't even know how to keep track of that. And people like Spotify really don't pay what they're supposed to pay. And it's, it's a whole different world. So we've lost 5,000 songwriters or so in the last eight or nine years because they can't make a living. They're either wow. teaching school or driving Ubers or they move back home. <laughs> building furniture. I actually know a couple of guys that are building furniture now. And I'm like, wait well, a minute, hey, remember when you were up for Brooks and Dunn, what are you doing putting in a floor? And they're like, well, well because there's, there's no money. Yeah. You know, and I don't know how a young songwriter would come to town and make a living because it used to be publishers would give you a draw, they called it, which is like a loan. Mm hmm against your songs that you were writing. And then when a song got recorded and the mechanicals came in that you paid them back what you had, what they had paid you through the mechanicals. But now seeing that there's no mechanicals, I don't know how they work out a deal with a songwriter. Wow. I actually um, co-wrote a Christian song and when I would get those little checks in the mail sure. <laughs> for the, for the residuals or whatever. And, uh, and I remember the last check I got was kind of a surprise because it was maybe 10 years ago or so. And it wasn't even a whole dollar. You know? right. oh, yeah. <laughs> they still sent me that check. But, you know, the very first check I got was something like, I don't remember. It was, you know, a couple thousand dollars. I was shocked. Right. Well, that's it was not when me mechanicals made you money yeah. and they, they don't exist anymore. That's sad. So, so how are you, you know, I know you're releasing albums of your own music. Right. Um, are you living off of past residuals or are you making, well, how you does know, that work? The one thing in my favor is I love going out and playing and I do shows with my band and I also do singer songwriter shows all around the country and Canada, Ireland, England, wherever they'll let me go. And, uh, and I love doing that. And I'm lucky because that brings in some money and, you know, I have other songwriter friends that don't like going out and playing live. So right. 
they have to figure out how they're going to make their money. Yeah. I, I've been lucky enough to step up on stage with you a few times because right. we, because I actually know a lot of the songs that you've written, uh, namely for Garth Brooks or the ones you've even co-written together. Right. He wasn't a demo artist though. How, in the, how did that actually transpire? Well, he was cleaning churches and selling boots when I met him and he <laughs> wanted to be a demo singer. That's how I met him. He brought a cassette over to my house of six songs and played me these songs. So I would use him as a demo singer. Wow. And I said, yeah, I'll start using you as a demo singer. And he told me that he wrote a little bit too. And so I'm thinking, okay, this guy's cleaning churches and selling boots. You know, I guess I'll write with him. And, uh, <laughs> The first song that we wrote when he was cleaning churches and selling boots and wasn't Garth Brooks was If Tomorrow Never Comes. Wow. And we uh, we thought we'd written a good song. We demoed it at my studio, just him and a guitar vocal, which can't be bad. And we pitched it around town and pitched him around town for 10 years or about a year and a half, something like that, 10 months, year and a half. It gets kind of nebulous, but uh, nobody was interested in the song. Nobody was interested in him. They said, no DJ is going to play somebody named Garth. It just sounds like you're gargling on the radio. And so one night he got to uh, play one song at the Bluebird Cafe because another artist didn't show up. And mm -hmm. somebody from Capitol Records was in the audience and heard him and came up afterwards and said, I know I passed on you for the third time this week, but maybe we missed something. Why don't you come back in? And he went back in and got a record deal. And If Tomorrow Never Comes was his second single and his first number one. Wow. Now, so that's magic and miracles of Nashville. I'm telling you, I remember going to, um, I worked at a CPA, you know, here are, we have to have other jobs to make a sure. living because I was in an all girl rock band and that wasn't really going anywhere. Well, we were playing for a lot of campuses, but sleeping on a lot of couches, you know what I'm sure. saying? So yeah. I finally got to the point where, um, I needed some real money and some insurance. So I started working in a business management CPA firm. And I remember the day um, that uh, I'm not trying to remember his, his man. It was Pam Lewis at the Pam time Lewis. and, yeah. um, and Bob, uh, Doyle. Bob Doyle. Yeah. Right. And they came in with this new guy. He's wearing the hat, got on the boots, the whole yeah. thing. And that was Garth. And he came in there with his brother who was, I suppose had just been hired to be his road manager at the time, Kelly Brooks. And I brought in coffee and tea and sodas and all the stuff for them to have there meeting and they had just signed him and we had him for about a year before he, he was just opening up for other artists right and he was opening up for steve um oh my god i forgot his name the he ended up writing some stuff for him or with him at steve warner time. yeah steve warner that's it i did a music video for him as well um down the pike that came after me working at this company but I remember that uh, Garth got us all really good seats, all the women in the office. You know, he's always very generous with us. And um, there we are sitting there and he's opening up for Steve. But a lot of the audience leaves after he plays. And shortly afterwards, Steve was like, you know what? I need to be opening up for you. And the humbleness, you know, right. I was there when that conversation went down and I thought, wow. Cause he was a rising star. He, he just catapulted. You right. Know? Yeah, he did. Um, he, what basically there were two or three things that made his career take off. One was friends in low places, which mm -hmm. became a huge, huge hit for college kids on up to 80 years old. Uh, the second thing was people started talking about his stage show. His yeah. stage show was more like a rock show and people weren't used to that in country music. So even when he was playing little state fairs and clubs, people would tell other people, well, this guy comes back to town, you need to see him. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing was his career exploded with friends in low places. But in the music business, you book events that you're going to play like a year, year and a half in advance. So he had all these gigs lined up at state fairs and, you know, things like that. And he could have canceled them all and taken the big money, but he played everyone that he had signed when he had no money and he wasn't getting any money, but that's the kind of guy that he is. Yeah. And I think that meant a lot to promoters, you know, that he wasn't going to back out because he could get a lot of money now. And mm -hmm. so that won him people over in the music business and the booking business. And then going to see him live is what won the crowds over. 
Yeah, he was pre- pretty amazing on stage, I got to say. And I'm lucky, you guys. I actually had a front row seat to a lot of this because at one point in time, I actually dated somebody within that circle. And so I went to a lot of these shows and I remember him being strapped to the to the harness and flying over the stage. And I'd be sitting with his mom and dad in the audience. Yeah. And she'd always be holding her heart like, oh, my God, my son. Well, that was, a lot of yeah. that was down in <laughs> Dallas. He flew across the stage singing a song that Kim Williams and he and I had written. Ain't going down till the sun comes up. Uh-huh. And uh, he when we finished that song, he said that's what he was going to do. And I thought he was delirious until I flew down to Dallas and saw him do it. And uh, the funny thing is he told Kim and I right before he did it, that the rope broke the day before. Oh my God. No. It was was up in the the air when the rope broke. So, you know, you gotta be a special kind of crazy person to, to choose like that, you know? Well, there's nobody like him, you know, uh, in so many different ways. And, and that's uh, definitely one of them. I remember when he decided he was going to do that, he said, I've got to lose 30 pounds or whatever it was. Right. And I'm in his kitchen and he's eating, he's pouring, what was it? Cheerios into a bowl. Right. And eating them without the milk. And yep. then he would pour another one and he, he would eat this whole box of cereal, but he wouldn't eat anything else because he was trying to take this weight off. Yep. And I was like, this guy's extreme. I could, but I know I'm extreme in a lot of ways too. I sort of get it. It's like, if I want, if I want to achieve something, I will jump through hoops to get there. And so, you know, I guess you got to have a little bit of crazy to get there. Well, you, 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 have, you have to be crazy, period, to move to Nashville. One, to think you could be a songwriter, an artist, and compete with uh, all the other people that have gone before. Mm-hmm. But you got to mm-hmm. be crazy enough to do it or else you're going to stay home in, in Knoxville or, you know, wherever and uh, and never come to town. So right. it's, it's uh, that kind of scheme of things on you figure out, well, how brave am I going to be? And um, he definitely has that. And the other thing that I loved about him that I learned very early on with him is when he was wanting to fly across the stage or have a fire on stage or whatever else, they'd all tell him, you can't do that. You know, that's, and <laughs> so his answer was, but if I could do that, how would I do that? Right. And to me, that fries people's brains when you say that, because it's like, Oh, well, I might have to think of a way we could do that. And um, that was very eye-opening for me that he didn't take no. He just said, okay, if we if we could do it, how would we do it? And to me, that's huge. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of Access Consciousness. Which oh, yeah, it's Gary Douglas. Well, he lives in the question. Yeah. He always lived in the question, you know? And that's something that I noticed about him. He goes, right. well, what if we could what if we could just go ahead and add two more shows and then I could fly to the next location and the bus is good because, because it would sell out and there'd be people that wouldn't get tickets. Cause I was there when that frenzy was going on. They'd, they'd had three shows sold out. He never advertised y'all ever. They spent $0 on advertising and you know, what artists could get away with that at the time. There's all these people coming to him wanting to, to, you know, do commercials, you know, on TV about him coming. It wasn't necessary. They didn't need it. And they would have maybe a day or two in between that they could have gone home. But he would be like, well, can we can we get the stadium for another day or two yeah. for these people? And he also, you guys, on sound check, he would, for different um, uh, organizations, per se, especially children's organizations, he would put on a little mini show for them. He would have them come to sound check and, you know, the band would come, they would dress even though it was sound check right. and he would well, do this for them. And I was like, wow, this guy, this guy. And then I was so fortunate later to be able to be on the team that did a lot of his music videos. And you're right. He wanted to do, I'm sure you guys remember the one where he's playing at the piano and he actually learned how to play that part. He also learned a saxophone part. Right. That's trained. exactly right. I remember him. Um, uh, James Horn was a guy that taught him. Right. He was one of our great, great, great horn player. I love that guy. Yeah. And, um, he wanted to go through this paint, which couldn't be paint. We, we tried it and then he started to go in and he started to get hypothermia. Sure. And so we had to scrap the whole thing because we realized we had to heat this up because it was watered down. It wasn't thick paint. We had to make it look right. that way. But we had to get a chemist in there to figure all of this out. And then one time he went down and he closed his eyes before and he goes, no, I want to actually go down with my eyes open. So we had to clean up the whole set and reshoot it again. 
Yeah. And he did go in with his eyes and came out. I mean, we, we couldn't shoot anymore because his eyes were like bloodshot from the I bet. whatever this was. And there's chemicals and everybody's telling him not to do it, that it's not a good idea. And he goes, you worry about you. I got me, you know. Right. And so, so mm-hmm. can do spirit. Exactly. That's why he's oh, where he is. And that's why he's Garth Brooks. Indeed, indeed. Yep, they'll never make another one like him, that's for sure. Exactly. And they'll never make another Kent Blaze either. <laughs> well, and you know, the thing about him, he is so generous like that, like with the kids you're talking about. He does so many things to help so many people that nobody even knows about. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, you know, he's been a big inspiration for me on the gifting that he does for people. and um, Generosity of spirit. Yeah, generosity of spirit. And when he's talking about stuff on the radio, he's always mentioning the songwriters and, you know, he gives them all the credit. And, um, you know, he's as great a writer as anybody, but he always talks about the songwriters. I remember one time um, my power went out. This was in my, my first my, my first home, um, kind of a scrappy neighborhood, right? He kept trying to get me to get out of there. Weren't and, they all uh, for us back then? Yeah, I know. Right? It was 700 square feet. Dude, and I and it had a window unit and I uh, had yeah. to get a propane tank to get central heat and air put into this house because there was no line to, to get that. So they would have to fill up my propane tank. Crazy. You know, big one. Big right. one. Anyway, I remember one time the power went out um, and I was stuck there by myself and he came over with his truck. The power went out because we had ice and storms and all of this. So right. he had his um, dually and he came over to pick me up and uh, you know, I'm like hunkered down in a fur coat, you know, it's old fur coat I'd gotten at a secondhand store with blankets and everything else. And he goes, girl, you're coming stay with us. So I'd packed a suitcase. He picks me up and then there's a car on the side of the road and he stops to see if they need help. Mm -hmm. And they're like, you know, there's no cell phones y'all. This is back in the olden days. <laughs> we right. Scrappy, you know. We had to have maps to find places and all the things. So here and he is. <laughs> I swear to goodness. So he asks and, and all of this, and he goes, is there anybody I can contact for you? And, you know, you give me a phone number. I can. So he brings me all the way to the house. He leaves, y'all. Picks up these people and brings them to a car dealership and buys them a car. Yep, that's true. That's a true story. That's, that's what he does. Guy he is. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I didn't mean to make this all about the Garth Brooks show. <laughs> well, you know, that's no. fine with me. Uh, you know. <laughs> well, I would like to talk about something else because we both. Um, well, we could talk about my new record. Yeah. From the Beatles to the Bluebird, wherever that is. Actually, yes, because here now, I've been listening to this album. And I remember you playing some of these songs um, when you performed last October, was it? Um, you played probably, a couple of songs, because one yeah. from 1962. And I love it because it's like a history lesson. What is that song? It's about when, uh, when the Beatles came. February 9th, 1964. That's it. 64, not 63, 64. Yeah. And, you know, part of this was I was over in Liverpool back last June and got my picture taken with the Beatles statues mm -hmm. and I was wearing a Bluebird sweatshirt and I just saw that picture and I thought that's a great album title uh -huh. and I had no songs but I just started thinking about the impact that the Beatles had on people and you know kids that are you know that weren't around anywhere near that time have no idea really the impact that that had that single show had on the whole world and how that changed the whole world. The, the whole country was um, in a, a depressed state because Kennedy had been shot. And uh, that was back in November of 63. And it was kind of like people walking around after 911 happened, you know, people were scared to go outside and didn't want to go out during the dark. And so the Beatles came on the Ed Sullivan show and it was the most watched show that had ever happened on TV up till that time. And it was a sound that nobody had heard before. Yeah. And it just really brought some joy back to the world that hadn't been there before. Mm -hmm. And um, as they kept growing and evolving, they changed the culture, they changed the music. 
uh, Paul McCartney and Ringo are still out there playing at 80 something years old and sounding oh, wow. great. And, uh, you know, there's another song on the album I wrote about McCartney called I Want to Die Young at a Very Old Age. Yeah. And that's what he's out there doing. And um, he and Bob Dylan, Willie Nelson, they're all an inspiration. Gary Douglas is an inspiration. You don't have to quit because mm -hmm. they're telling you you're old. And uh, there's for another sure. song I kind of wrote for him called Stay Wild. And um, is that about Gary? It's he's one of them, you oh, know, thanks. and uh, Willie Nelson, you know, uh, David Crosby, uh, Jeff Beck, these people that passed away, they mm -hmm. did what they did and they didn't try to be anybody else. And right. no matter how old they got, they were still doing what they do and being great at it. And uh, that's such an inspiration to me, because in the music business these days, if you're 45 years old, they're, you're over the hill. I have yeah, friends that have had number one records and they're trying to get a deal for publishing or whatever. And they're like, well, you're too old, you know, go away. And uh, so this was kind of like a song to help them realize they don't have to believe what other people are telling them about they're over with. Right. And uh, that's another reason why I, I do records every year. I write what I want to write and I say what I want to say. And I'm not trying to uh, compete with music row on it because they don't want to write what I'm writing and I'm fine with that. Yeah, it seems like there's a formula now. And I've watched a lot of country crossover duets and, and whatnot. I mean, I was listening to popular radio the other day. I jump over to because I want to hear what's it's called Hits One or whatever. And it's amazing how many country artists' <laughs> songs are being played, but they don't really sound kind of, maybe they're vocally they sound a little country or right. or they're crossing over with a rapper or whatever it is. And I'm like right wonder what happened to to country music what's the well changed kind of what happened to it is you know the the kids that are coming up now that are in their 20s they grew up with rap they grew up with all that kind of stuff and they're so they're starting to incorporate it into country music um the, the big change is now they have these people called track people that do the tracks. Yeah, they're called track guys. And so if you and I were writing a song, your publisher would want a track guy in the room to build all the tracks while you're writing the song. And um, then at the end of the day, you sing it and you have a demo, which the publishers like because they don't have to pay anything. But right. the other thing is, it, it's not organic anymore. It's not sitting down with a guitar and a piano and just writing from the heart. It's like, you know, you got a track guy in the room with you and he gets co-writer on the song. And, I know. Uh, and, <laughs> that um, happened to me. It's just, it's bizarre to me. And then mm -hmm. now you see that there's eight, nine, ten writers on some songs. And that's pretty amazing to me that some of these songs take that many people to write a song. And um, that's why I like writing by myself. You know, I, I can do it and I love doing it. And so... That's and what it's I all do. you. It's not right. what they're saying you you have to. Because I remember um, I one night came out to see you at a place that no longer exists. It's very sad because it was one very, of the first very places. Very sad. Very sad. One of the first places I ever played in back when the, the window area was where this. Well, now the stage is there again, actually, because they moved it around a couple of times. But needless um, to say, I went out to see you perform and you handed me a a tambourine and I got up there and sang some songs with you. Didn't know that was going to happen. I think it was the first time you'd ever asked me to come up on the stage. And in the audience was a fellow that had moved from uh, California uh, to work at a record label. And he was supposed to find people to get record deals for. And he was there with his wife and he came up to me afterwards and he gave me his card and he had a French accent. His name was Zev Nebier. And he, said, listen, I want to talk to you. And I, I, I just assumed because this always happened where people would want me to come into their studio and maybe sing, you know, demo one of their songs or a jingle or something. Right. So I told him, I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm tied up, but I could do something next week. The guy did his homework, found out my history, all the things that had happened with, with Indy and all the stuff. And he thought, oh my gosh, I've got a gold mine here. Cause he'd seen all my YouTube videos. He goes, she can actually sing. She can actually write songs. She's cute. You know, whatever. And she has a story. Oh my God, this story about how she survived, you know, this terrorist attack. So he was like, had all this stuff. And I come to him not knowing what's going on. And it all stemmed from me come to sing with you. You just never know, awesome. follow the energy, what it's going to be. But what ended up happening was, is I ended up 
writing these eight songs that he was putting tracks to. I had to give him writer's credit, even though sure. he didn't write any of it. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Uh -huh. um, it was my friends that played on the album that would come in and, and I would spoon feed them what I wanted, but he, he did the drum machine part of it. And then when it all came down to an end, they told him that the two artists that he was working with, one was a country artist who was like 40, I guess, that we were too old. Right. And he needed to go back and find some people in their 20s at the most 30. And I've had this discrimination before. I mean, I've auditioned, I've been asked to audition for The Voice several times. And they all, and I get all the way up to the part where they would fly me to LA and then they would say, well, you know, we're going a different direction <laughs> or whatever. And then I found out later they didn't, they didn't want somebody my age on the show. Sure. So it's, not well, really, it's not really about the voice. Well, you know, there's another song on the record called old man living in a young man's town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of looking back on how it was when I got here and how it is now. And, you know, kind of the discrimination that you feel by being older than 40 years old. And it's yeah. just pretty crazy to me because, um, you know, some of the greatest writers in Nashville kept writing until they were 65 or 70. And then they just said, I've had enough. But um, these days it's not really like that. It's all the hottest, newest, who, who can we get that, you know, it's a pop artist that can sing with us or a pop producer that can produce us. And it's just a different world. And, uh, it's not good or bad, right or wrong. It's just a different world. And, and so you just have to keep reinventing yourself uh, on who you are rather than getting stuck with, well, I'm too old now or, you know, yeah, yeah. nobody loves me anymore. And, and, uh, <laughs> I'm lucky know. enough that I have friends that are in local bands that draw. And so they'll ask me to perform with them. And I, I love that I get to get on stage and and sing and, and play percussion or, or whatever. But before COVID, before COVID hit, um, there were people I could just text and they would let me do a short set in front of a band that was coming in from out of town. Right. You know? It was that easy. And then after COVID, a lot of these places had shut down or they got new younger managers and all this. And I would try to get in and do a show. And they're like, well, how many YouTube hits do you have? Exactly. That's what it's all about these days. How many social numbers right. do you have? How many fans can you bring in? And my thing is, well, what are you doing? Yeah. Why are you not promoting me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so crazy. It's, so a, crazy. it's a wild time. Hmm. So I do know this about you. Your songs are always, or at least I, I'm going to assume that I know about you. Your songs are always, you know, from the heart, something that you're experiencing. It's like this one to me is almost like a history lesson because right. you're going back and sharing. Um, and every one of your albums is, has I've noticed been kind of theme oriented where um, you have some kind of cohesiveness, like the way albums used to be right. when they would sort of tell stories. Um, what, I mean, I know you got that picture taken and it was like, okay, from the Beatles to the Bluebird, which I love that that's so clever, you know, um, what sparks you? What, what happens when you get that creative juices going? Is it something that you just experience or? How do you just sit down with a guitar and go? Well, you know, for me, like you were talking about an album having some kind of cohesive uh, theme to it. And so many of the records that I grew up with that were my favorite records kind of had that. And it was the kind of thing where you wanted to hear the whole record. You might have heard a single on the radio, but then you went and bought the record and mm -hmm. you found out there were songs you loved even more than the ones that were on the radio. And so I try to every time my target is to have a cohesive flow to the records. Um, these days with the downloading and stuff, most people don't download records anymore. They just download the song they heard on the radio. And right. to me, that's kind of sad because there's a lot of great songs that are on records that never get heard these days. Um, you know, back when they started going to streaming, it was one of those things like I just talked about earlier. If you and I wrote a song for George Strait, say, and the CD sold, you would, we would both make some money. Well, when it went to streaming with, let's just say Apple, when they started downloading, you could have a song on a George Strait record, but if nobody downloaded your song off that record, you didn't make any money. So you could say, Hey, I've got a George Strait cut, but it doesn't mean anything unless it got downloaded. Right. And now even downloading is gone and it's more just streaming. And uh, it's a really strange situation that, 
uh, the music business doesn't really know how to deal with it so far. And uh, definitely songwriters don't know how to deal with it. Uh, it all comes from the Justice Department setting the rates on how we get paid, and they don't even know how streaming everything works. So it's way beyond them because they're all old men. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's a whole different world now because I know a good friend of mine, and you met her. She works at MCA Records when we all had lunch that day with Celeste, uh, right. Joanna Carter. And right. she's like all this ageism, even with her, you know, she's been dealing with uh, putting together the people and, and choosing. That's how we met, actually, because she used a lot of my directors and then we right. became friends. But, you know, she said, I feel like I'm getting aged out of out of the label. I mean, well, sure she's you on are. The board for several prestigious things. And, you know, so she's an older lady. We've known each other for 30 years, so you can only imagine. And um, she goes, I'm, I'm ready to retire, but I am taking it all the way as far as I can because they're offering them deals to pay them out, to get rid of them, to bring right. in young people. And she goes, and I've got to train these people. And they have a completely different idea about right. how things are going. And she's brilliant. She's an, an hearted person. And she's best friends with all these artists because she was there in their very beginning days, you know. But uh, see, that doesn't really matter much anymore. Um, it's interesting for a lot of different ways. Like Garth and I are still friends. We still write together. Um, these days you can write a number one song with somebody and you'll never hear from them again because they're on to what's the newest, hottest thing that I can do. And um, it's just a different world from what it was back then. So there's not the loyalty that was there before. And, you know, the thing about Garth Brooks is he was 25 years old when we wrote If Tomorrow Never Comes. Oh, my God. And, We're um, all babies the, then. <laughs> the depth of the songwriting that he has on his records uh, compared to the depth of the songwriting that's coming out these days is totally different. There's no 25 year old country artist that would even get what if tomorrow never comes means, you know, we have uh, Luke Bryant being in his forties, still singing about spring break and you go, come on guy, you know, you got two kids and uh, you're married, you know, there's gotta be other things you can sing about, but uh, that's, that's that whole youth thing, you know, trying to, trying to stay young. And he's had some, hardships i mean his mother and his sister i think both died before his career really took off right. so you would think you would have something to pull from you know kind of interesting well you know it's it's sometimes it's beyond what they want to do but what the label wants them to do or what the producer wants them to do you know you can't be saying stuff like that it's got to be happy you know it's got to be radio friendly and uh that's why there's not the songs that there were back in the nineties, like the song remembers when, or walk away oh, Joe right. or ships that don't come in or the dance, things like that. There's, there's none of those out there these days that make you pull over to the side of the road. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the other thing is like on Garth's album, half the songs on every album he did were outside songs. So he had songs like friends in low places that took him to a whole nother level. Yeah. Uh, he had the dance, he had shameless, um, baton rouge and now the artists because there's very little money they're told they have to write every song that's on the record and here's the writers that you're going to write with and right. i think it just dilutes uh what's being out there and sometimes if they'd find a, an outside song that's great it might take their career further than it's taken it right now because we don't have any new superstars really coming up mm -mm, in country not, really. music. not like we did before but i think it's the lack of of material that could take them to another level. Well, it's interesting too, because I can remember uh, buying that vinyl and looking at the artwork and reading all the words to all the songs as I was listening to it. Right. And I remember I fell in love uh, with Billy Joel. Sure. He had those theme albums and it was one of those things where I didn't know turnstiles existed until I bought the second album that had uh, one of his big hit songs on. And I went to buy the album for that one song, found the other album, hadn't even listened to the rest of this album, but went ahead and bought Turnstiles anyway and fell in love with songs on there, like Angry Young Man, which mm -hmm. would never get radio airplay. It's too long. Right. And I love that song. And I practiced along with those albums to learn my harmonies. And I remember one time being in the car with my mom, we were coming back from Florida and there was the Garth Brooks channel and she was getting sleepy and I was getting sleepy. And I said, do you mind if I sing along 
And so I started singing along to Angry Young Man, all those harmonies. And you know that song when it's all over the place and the piano. Da, 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 and I'm nailing all these harmonies. And when the song got done, I heard, <laughs> I looked over at her and went, are you okay? Because she's crying. Right. She said, you're so good. Makes me want to cry now. She goes, you're so good. Why don't people know who you are? And I said, because I don't, won't do what they want me to do, mom. You know, it's, I was always that person. We had record deal as the paper dolls. We did. But I didn't want to cut or dress. The, they wanted to make us something we were not. Sure, like the bangles or, you know, go-go's or something like that. Yeah, they know. were actually trying to make us more like the go-go's because the bangles yeah. actually played their own instruments, but they did have a dresser and all of that stuff. In addition, right. I've seen the documentaries and all all the things like a like the Beatles documentary. I don't know if you've seen it. It's oh, kind yeah. Of amazing. It's kind of amazing. Or yeah, uh, Steps from Stardom for about the background vocalists also. That's an amazing. Well, document. you know, the thing of it is, too, um, you could be singing all those parts and she'd say, well, aren't you a big star? Well, you know, when I go out and play, people come up and say, well, how come you're not on the radio singing your songs? And it's like yeah. they don't really have a clue what all goes into uh, getting out on the radio. But, mm -hmm. you know, the, the thing that I loved about the Beatles thing, and I watched all three parts of it, was when they were in that big uh, studio that was like a movie set or whatever, there was just no chemistry whatsoever. Yeah. They couldn't really get much going. Then they moved into their studio, and the magic started happening a little more. And it was cool. You got to see McCartney start right and get back from the very beginning. But mm -hmm. then when they got on stage, and they hadn't played on stage in probably five or six years together, there was that magic that was still there. The years faded away, all the fights, everything else. It was just, we're up here playing music and we're having fun. And that was one of the most magical experiences for me to witness in a long time. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Beautiful. You guys, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make sure the links to the movies we're talking about or the documentaries we're talking about are down there. So, so you can explore as well, if you're curious. Cause and uh, the links to my record. Oh, that is a, already done. Already done. <laughs> I've already written it up. It's already there. And I've already uh, sent it to my people, but I'm, but my people are going to be getting some more links is what I'm trying okay. to say. Ask your they people to give it to you. other people that there's the people. <laughs> okay. Well, here, um, we also know each other be because of Gary Douglas. It's, it's, it's his fault. You actually brought him to Nashville. So you guys, if you don't know, and you're watching this for the first time, you never see my podcast. Um, Gary Douglas is the founder of access consciousness. Um, Dr. Dane here is a co-founder. And um, way back, way back, like we were talking about Kent first. Way back. He um, hosted Gary at his house. And uh, Access was very small then. It was only in, I believe, Australia and in the Americas. There was kind yeah, New of a, New Zealand. I was and, in New Zealand also. In America, and that was it. And not very many places in America. Yeah, very small organization. But you were pulled in to the things that he had to say. And um, it's kind of a different way of living your life. How did you meet Gary? That's the question I have. Well, it was, I was uh, friends with these people who had moved here from LA and they were, as they say, woo woo people. And uh, <laughs> uh, they moved to Nashville because she was a lawyer and the music business in the nineties was all moving to Nashville and they'd had the old, uh, mudslides and tornadoes and earthquakes and all that. And they got out of LA. And so we became friends and I started writing songs with her boyfriend. And one night she called me up and said, Hey, we're going here. This person channel, do you want to go with us? And, mm -hmm. uh, I thought, well, you know, why not? And we went and it was a woman by the name of Sharon Miller. Oh. And, um, she, started talking about things and I was going to ask some questions and it's like, she already answered my questions about the music business before I even asked them. <laughs> and so I thought right out of your head. Yeah. So afterwards I went up to her and said, you know, I want to get on the fast track of, of spirituality and consciousness. And so she recommended two things. One was access. And the other thing is this thing in Pennsylvania where you can, uh, they teach you how to, uh, you know, uh, meditate, but also how to astral project and all this kind of stuff by listening wow. to, I forget what they're called now, but, um, but access kind of drew me. So she was having a little class in her apartment 
in, um, where was it? I think Houston, Texas. Oh. And so, no, it was in San Antonio. So I flew down there not knowing anything about anything. And um, <laughs> so we had this little class and I think she was teaching the bars thing. And um, Gary had been teaching a foundation or one or something somewhere else. And so she wanted us to meet him. So we all met a little meet and three place. And, um, you know, I met him and uh, it didn't really hit me. You know, it's kind of like when I met Garth the first time. Okay, oh. this is, but, um, you know, all of a sudden we just became really good friends and I was bringing him to town a lot. And the big thing was he heard me sing at a Riders in the Round show one night in Nashville when he was in, and it was some pretty spectacular people on there. And he said afterwards, you're a really good writer, but you're a terrible singer. <laughs> and I'd already heard that That's before. That's what friends you are know. for. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I moved to Nashville, I would take my songs around and they'd say, well, I like the song, but who the hell's singing it? You know, <laughs> and so I would say, well, I don't know, some guy I found. And so anyway, <laughs> At one class we were doing, he worked on my voice for about an hour, an hour and a half. And the next day he worked on it for another hour, an hour and a half. And my voice improved some, but over a period of time of six months to a year, it kept getting better and better and better. And it keeps getting better and better. And due to that, I was able to sing on the Grand Ole Opry a couple times and be on some records. And the whole thing opened up and it was because of his help with my voice. Right. He did this a similar thing for me. He and Dane were in Italy and I had uh, passed the first two rounds for the voice and had to go in for another audition. And for me, I didn't have to stand in line. I, I got ushered in. I still had to wait an hour, but it wasn't like these people that would stand. Now they do it all online, but it's very interesting. Uh, I had reached out to Dane because I didn't know how to get a hold of Gary. I didn't know where he was because he didn't have the two phones. Like, you know, when he travels, he doesn't have the other phone. So uh, I reached out to Dane. I texted him and I said, um, dude, I, I'm going to have this audition in a couple of days. Uh, do you think that Gary could work on my voice? And he goes, I'll reach out to him. And they called me and it was like, um, it was really late for them. And I was in my car and Gary gets on the phone with me and he goes, okay. I, and he, tells me what to do. And he basically said, I want you to sing a line of a song until I tell you to stop. But I want you to sing it like you're pulling the chrome off of the 57 Chevy bumper. Right. So there I was looking at the car in front of me, imagining that I was pulling it, you know, and I sang it and he stopped me. And then I sang again, he stopped me. And we were maybe on the phone for 10 minutes. Right. And then um, he said, I don't want you to sing again until the audition. And I was like, oh shit, that's in 48 hours. And I usually do vocal warm ups and all that. And I thought, well, I'm not going to be able to do it. But I went in, didn't even have to warm up. And I'm that way today. I could be laying flat on my back and just, it just comes out. And it was, you know, a lot of time I imagine he's perfected whatever he's doing because he worked with you. When was that? Do you remember what year it was? It was probably mid to late 90s, I bet. And, um, you know, that's the other thing. I don't have to warm up before I go play either. I can just go in and, and start singing and everybody else is doing vocal gymnastics or whatever. Right. And I, I just start singing. And uh, I think that's part of it. And, oh, you know, wow. I, was, I was his first uh, guinea pig, if you want to say that. Now he has the class that you teach, uh, right voice for you, you know. And I um, love that class. I love well, it. It's, it's an amazing class and it's an amazing thing that he's developed. And, you know, it went from taking three hours with me to 10 minutes for you because he's got <laughs> A lot more things he can work on real fast and yeah it's just uh but he's that kind of him he and dane both are that gracious kind of person that will do that for you you know take the time to see the greatness that you are and help you embellish it and that's totally different than what a lot of this reality is these days and uh story. you know they remind me garth reminds me so much of gary and vice versa yeah. that uh it's pretty fun to be around great people like that. Wouldn't it be nice to get those two together? Well, I've, I've had them in the same place at the same time, a couple times, hmm. just kind of to seeing if I could, uh, you know, get them together and, you know, well, never give up, never get it in and never quit. That's right. <laughs> when the time is right, you know, you get it when you get it. All the exactly. things. I can't imagine them not having a 
spectacular conversation as those two, you know? So what else is possible? That's right. What That's the, I, I live by that. Like you do. How's it get better? And what else is possible Two yeah. Gary Douglas sayings that can change the whole world. Mm -hmm. It sure does. But whatever you do, you guys don't try it. I don't yeah, know. Right. I love, I love. It, also. Won't, work. it won't work. Yeah. <laughs> it won't work for you just for us. That's um, right. There is also an app that I love the who does this belong to app that whenever I get sure. too stuck in my head, I'll have it remind me like every 30 minutes for like four or five days straight. And then I'm finally back on track again. So yeah, I love those guys. Their, their generosity of spirit is off the chain. It really is. And so many great tools on how to navigate this world. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need all of that we can get these days. What is your favorite tool of access anyway? If you have, you know, like the one you find you use the most or whatever. Uh, what I start every day off with is all of life comes to me with ease and joy and glory 10 times. And then all of life comes to us with ease and joy and glory 10 times. And mm -hmm. uh, every night I do the same thing when I'm going off to sleep. And uh, it's just a different way to approach life without trauma and drama and sadness. And um, the more you can get into that framework, the more you see that magic showing up. And um, that to me is a, a simple, powerful tool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll say that lately what I've noticed is how psychically connected I am with the heavy light tool. Cause I'll wake right. up like this morning, I woke up and my sinuses were kind of bugging me and I didn't want the coffee. My, 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 I started to walk towards the coffee machine and my body like takes me in another direction. So it's no, you need to get in your hot tub and meditate first, go there. So right. <laughs> that's where I started, you know? And so I'm finding that my whole life is this walking, talking meditation of following the energy. It was like coming to your show. Right. I was with a client late. I had cutoffs. Normally I don't go out in the world like that, but I didn't want to miss your show. And I knew mm -hmm. that all I could do is put on a ball cap and high top sneakers. And I might get there five minutes before you got started, which is what happened. And from that, I got eight songs. You right. know, I knew I had to be there. I was like, you know, I'm getting pulled. Don't worry about putting makeup on or changing into something cutesy pootsy. Just get out the door, girl. And, you know. And it worked for that guy that was there. Yeah, it did. You know? it did, it did. And uh, that's the thing, showing up. Mm -hmm. You know, and being willing to show up and follow the energy on what feels like, well, I need to go here. Even you keep going, well, I don't need to do that. You keep getting that little voice going, well, I think you need to be there. Yes. That's when you you would be better off following that little voice and, and doing that, following the, the lightness rather than the heaviness or the yes right. instead of the no. And um, that's it. all part of, of what we can gather from access. So I love it. Well, I got to ask you one last question because it is called the choosing happiness uh, podcast. So what, cause my listeners guts to know, uh -oh. Mr. Lazy, yeah. What do you do to get your happy on? And I'm, we all know you love to play your guitar and sing, but right. what, is there something else? You know, I don't have just one thing. Um, from beginning the day with how's it get better than this? I wake up happy. I wait, wake up next to an angel every day. Yeah. So, um, we love Miss Cindy. Up next to her. And then I have a, a labradoodle that jumps up on the bed and kisses me in the morning. And, you know, <laughs> it kind of starts the day. I go walk at this beautiful place that has a lake that has so much phen phenomenal energy. It just always gets me in a good mood. I get to work with great people or I get to work with myself and, and, uh, my target every day is just what can I do today to create fun, right. magic and miracles. And uh, so it's just, it's setting the whole tone from the beginning of the day and waking up with Dane, that little 20 minute thing he's done. It's yeah. just a phenomenal thing to listen to in the morning to get yourself going. I'll listen to it while I'm on, doing my outdoor walks. If it's not too hot, then I'll, I'll take it outdoors. Otherwise right. I'm on the treadmill throwing algorithms at my TV. Yeah. There you go. That's a whole nother podcast. We won't get into that. Oh, yeah, but, we won't get uh, into that, but keep throwing them. I will. I'm going to take care of it. Um, so where could the good people find you? If they were looking for you. And I will have all the links, but just for well, those that might be listening in their car or whatever. Yeah, it's all the links uh, that everybody goes to these days. You know, I would suggest Apple because for songwriters, they at least pay a little bit better. Uh, they at least pay, which some of them don't pay. <laughs> right. But uh, also, if you wanted a, a hard copy of uh, any of the records I've done, 
uh, kentblazy.com and also my tour schedules on there when I remember to put them on there. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm not real good at it. But, you gotta have uh, people. You gotta have people. I, I, I have my people I, do my things. I do know? have one woman, Bev Moser, who's a PR person here in town, who kind of whips me in the shape. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's just I have to remember to do it. Oh, I've got these gigs. I haven't told her anything about. So oh, wow. uh, you know, it's part yeah, of my. You, you book it yourself, don't you? Yeah, I book all of them myself. You know, and in crazy sort of ways, but uh, that's fine with me. I love it. Well, this has been a phenomenal conversation and uh, well, I could talk to you. Me. Yeah, absolutely. And when you get your next album, let's have another talk. There you go. Well, I'll start working on it then. So you're, <laughs> you're perspiring me. That's right. You better get busy. I'm putting you to that's work because right. you know, you're, you're going to be 150 and still writing songs. I just know. Well, it. that's what I'm aiming for. I want to die young at a very old age. There you go. There you go. So, Hey, you guys, if you like this conversation, uh, please hit the subscribe button. And if you know of others that this conversation, you know, could be a contribution to, please share. And um, if there's anything you want to know about or talk about on the podcast, maybe you've got a suggestion for me. I do read all the comments and I do comment on comments. So by all means, reach out and, and touch me. Thank you for having me and thank everybody that watches this thing. Yeah, absolutely. And listens on all the places. Well, there this you go. YouTube. Whatever. Yeah, we got YouTube and Spotify and Apple and all the places. So all the places. Yeah. Okay. Thank you again, Kent. I uh -huh. adore you. <laughs> well, I adore you too. And we will uh, talk about the next album when I get it done. All righty then. You got your assignment. That's your homework. All I right. Like ciao, y'all. Mm. Thank you. Till next bye -bye. time. Bye. Thank you so much for choosing happiness. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, share, and give us a like. And if you want more happy, subscribe to the Choosing Happiness membership where you can play directly with me, Rudrani Davy, the happiness lady. How does it get any better than that?